Do you want to have more fun? Do you want to do better in school, sports or other activities? Do you want your parents to treat you better? There is one simple way to do this. Improve your attitude. Attitude is what we think about something or someone. It often shapes how to react to the things that happen to us. Attitude will shape your life for better or for worse. The great thing is that your attitude is your choice. You can't change what happens to you, but you can choose how you react. That choice will always be yours. As someone said, I am convinced that life is 10% what actually happens and 90% how I react to it. Adversity and problems will test your attitude. How you respond will make all the difference. So the moral is, if you have the great attitude, you will very likely have a great life. Good morning students. Welcome to SST So Simple Tutorial. Today we will discuss the following topics of Unit 3. How participants saw the movement, limits of civil disobedience movement. The Great Depression of 1929 had a great impact on India. Agricultural prices began to fall from 1926 and collapsed after 1930. As the demand for agricultural goods fell and exports declined, peasants found it difficult to sell their harvests and pay their revenue. By 1930, the countryside was in turmoil. In the countryside, rich peasant communities like the Patidars of Gujarat and the Jats of Uttar Pradesh were active in the movement. They were producers of commercial crops. They were very hard hit by the trade depression and falling prices. As their cash income disappeared, they found it impossible to pay the government's revenue demand. And the government's refusal to reduce the revenue led to a widespread resentment. These rich peasants became the supporters of the civil disobedience movement, organizing their communities and at times forcing reluctant members to participate in the boycott program. For them, the fight for Swaraj was a struggle against high revenues, but they were deeply disappointed when the movement was called off in 1931, without the revenue rates being revised. So when the movement was started in 1932, many of them refused to participate. The poor peasantry was not just interested in the lowering of the revenue demand. Many of them were small tenants cultivating land they had rented from landlords. As the depression continued and cash incomes declined, the small tenants found it difficult to pay their rent. They wanted the unpaid rent to the landlord to be remitted. Apprehensive of raising issues that might upset the rich peasants and landlords, the Congress was unwilling to support no rent campaigns in most places. So the relationship between the poor peasants and Congress remained uncertain. Let's talk about the business class now. How did they relate to the civil disobedience movement? During the First World War, Indian merchants and industrialists had made huge profits and become powerful. They were keen to expand their business. They now reacted against colonial policies that restricted business activities. They wanted protection against import of foreign goods and a rupee sterling foreign exchange ratio that would discourage imports. To organize business interests, they formed the Indian Industrial and Commercial Congress in 1920 and the Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industries that is FIKI in 1927, led by prominent industries like Pursottam Das Thakudas and G.D. Birla, the industries attacked colonial control over the Indian economy and supported the civil disobedience movement when it was first launched. They gave financial assistance and refused to buy or sell imported goods. Most businessmen came to see Swaraj as a time when colonial restrictions on business would no longer exist and trade and industry would flourish without constraints. But after the failure of Roundtable Conference, business groups were no longer uniformly enthusiastic. They were apprehensive of the spread of militant activities and worried about prolonged disruption of business, as well as the growing influence of socialism among the younger members of the Congress. Now. Let's study about the industrial working class. The industrial working classes did not participate in the civil disobedience movement in large numbers except in the Nagpur region. As the industrialists came closer to the Congress, workers stayed aloof. But in spite of that, some workers did participate in the civil disobedience movement. 
selectively adopting some of the ideals of Gandhian program like boycott of foreign goods as part of their own movements against low wages and poor working conditions. There were strikes by the railway workers in 1930 and dock workers in 1932. But the Congress was reluctant to include workers' demands as a part of its program. It felt that it would alienate industrialists and divide the anti-imperial forces. Now let's study about women's participation. They participated in the civil disobedience movement in large numbers. During Gandhiji's salt march, thousands of women came out of their homes to listen to him. They participated in protest marches, they manufactured salt and picketed foreign clothes and liquor shops. Many went to jail. Moved by Gandhiji's call, they began to see service to the nation as a sacred duty of women. Yet this increased public role did not necessarily mean any radical changes in the way the position of women was visualized. Gandhiji was convinced that it was the duty of women to look after home and hearth, be good mothers and good wives. And for a long time, the Congress was reluctant to allow women to hold any position of authority within the organization. It was keen only on its symbolic presence, but see how the time has changed. Today the Congress party is led by a woman since so many years. Now let's move on to the next subtopic, limits of civil disobedience. One group who didn't participate in the movement was the group of untouchables, also called Dalits or oppressed classes. For long, the Congress had ignored the Dalits for fear of offending the conservative high-class Hindus. But Mahatma Gandhi declared that Swaraj would not come for a hundred years if untouchability was not eliminated. Students, whenever we normally talk of Mahatma Gandhi, the images that come to our mind is that of a freedom fighter. But he was a social reformer too. His greatest achievement in the field of social reform was the campaign against inhuman institution of untouchability. He, it was he who coined the term Harijan, which means children of God. He also started a nationwide movement against untouchability. He organized Satyagraha to secure them entry into temples, access to public wells, tanks, roads and schools. He himself cleaned toilets to dignify the work of the sweepers. He persuaded upper castes to change their hearts and give up the sin of untouchability. But many Dalit leaders were keen on a different political solution to the problems of the community. They began organizing themselves, demanding reserve seats in educational institutions and a separate electorate that would choose Dalit members for legislative councils. Political empowerment, they believed, would resolve the problems of their social disabilities. Dalit participation in the civil disobedience movement was therefore limited, particularly in the Maharashtra and Nagpur region where their organization was quite strong. Now enters Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, who is considered the architect of Indian constitution, organized the Dalits into the Dalit the Depressed Classes Association in 1930. He insisted on the necessity of separate electorates for the depressed classes. He clashed with Mahatma Gandhi at the second round table conference by demanding separate electorates for Dalits. When the British government conceded Ambedkar's demand, Gandhiji began a fast unto death. According to Mahatma Gandhi, separate electorates for Dalits would slow down the process of their integration into the society. Ambedkar ultimately accepted Gandhiji's position and the result was the Pune Pact of September 1932. What is Pune Pact? It was a pact signed by Gandhiji and Ambedkar on 24 September 1932. It gave the depressed classes seats in the provincial and central legislative councils, but they were to be voted in by the general electorate. Another group that did not participate in the civil disobedience movement was the Muslims. After the decline of the non-cooperation Khilafat movement, a large section of Muslims felt alienated from the Congress. From the mid-1920s, the Congress came to be more visibly associated with Hindu groups like the Hindu Mahasabha. Relations between Hindus and Muslims started to worsen. Each community organized religious processions with militant fervor. This provoked Hindu-Muslim communal clashes and there were riots in various cities. Each riot 
deepened the distance between the two communities. In order to break the ice between the Congress and the Muslim League, a group of prominent Muslims met at Delhi in 1927. They knew that the greatest constitutional contention between Muslim League and Congress was the matter of separate electorate. Jinnah and company declared that they would withdraw the demand of the separate electorates if Muslims were assured reserved seats in the Central Assembly and representation in proportion to population in the Muslim dominated provinces that is in Bengal and Punjab. An all party conference met in 1928 and constituted a committee to draft the constitution. The committee submitted its report in 1929. The Muslim League, which was the part of this all parties conference, rejected the report primarily because of the absence of separate electorates for the Muslims. Thus, when the civil disobedience movement started, there was an atmosphere of suspicion and distrust between communities. Large sections of the Muslims could not respond to the call of the united struggle. Many Muslim leaders and intellectuals expressed their concern about the status of Muslims as a minority within India. They feared that the culture and identity of minorities would be submerged under the domination of Hindu majority. This brings us to the close of today's class. So let us go for a recap. Rich peasants. They were hit by trade depression and falling prices. They found it impossible to pay the government's revenue demand. There was dissentment over refusal of reduction in revenue demand by the government. For them, Swaraj meant a struggle against the high revenue. Hence, they supported the civil disobedience movement. Poor peasants. They were not just interested in lowering of revenue demand. Depression made it impossible to pay rent to landlords. They wanted the unpaid rent to the landlord be remitted. Congress was unwilling to support no rent campaigns in most places. Business classes. They were keen to expand their businesses. They wanted protection against import of foreign goods. They formed FIKI in 1927. They gave financial assistance to Congress and refused to buy or sell imported goods. They saw Swaraj at a time when colonial restrictions on business would no longer exist and trade and industry would flourish without constraints. Industrial Working Class There was limited participation of industrial working class due to closeness of Congress with the industrialists. They were engaged in some sort of boycott of foreign goods against low wages and poor working conditions. The Congress was reluctant to include their demands, fearing alienation of industries. Women Thousands of women came out of their homes to listen to Mahatma Gandhi during the Salt March. They participated in protest marches, manufactured salt and picketed foreign cloth and liquor shops. Many also went to jail. They began to see service to the nation as a sacred duty of women. Dalits Mahatma Gandhi declared that Swaraj would not come for 100 years if untouchability was not eliminated. He coined the term Harijan. He organized Satyagraha to secure them entry into temples, access to public wells, tanks, roads and schools. He himself cleaned toilets to dignify the work of the sweepers. He persuaded upper castes to change their hearts and give up the sin of untouchability. B. R. Ambedkar, the champion of Dalits, he organized the Dalits into the Depressed Classes Association in 1930. He insisted on the necessity of separate electorates for the depressed classes. He clashed with Mahatma Gandhi at the second round table conference by demanding separate electorates for Dalits. Muslims After the decline of non-cooperation movement, they felt alienated from the Congress. In order to break the ice between the Congress and Muslim League, a group of prominent Muslims met at Delhi in 1927. Jinnah and company declared that they would withdraw the demand of separate electorates if 
Muslims were assured reserved seats in Central Assembly and representation in proportion to the population in Muslim dominated provinces of Bengal and Punjab. The Muslim League rejected the report of all parties conference in 1928 because of the absence of separate electorates for Muslims. They feared that the culture and identity of minorities would be submerged under the domination of the Hindu majority. So they didn't participate in the civil disobedience movement. Students, now you should be able to answer these questions. 1. Why did the peasants join the movement? The rich peasants, I am discussing first, were hard hit by the trade depression and falling prices of cash crops. They found it difficult to pay the government's revenue. But the government refused their demand to reduce the revenue. So, there was resentment among them and they supported the civil disobedience movement. Now I write two points for poor peasants also. So the poor peasants joined the movement due to high rents that were demanded by the landlords. They demanded reduction in revenue and unpaid rent to, of the landlord to be remitted. 2. Analyze the role of merchants and industrialists in the civil disobedience movement. During the First World War, Indian merchants and industrialists had made profits and became powerful. Keen on expanding their business, they now reacted against colonial policies that restricted business activities. They wanted protection against import of foreign goods and a rupee sterling foreign exchange ratio that would discourage imports. They refused to buy or sell imported goods and gave financial assistance to the movement. Most businessmen came to see Swaraj at the time when colonial restrictions on business would no longer exist and trade and industry would flourish without restraints. Now you can see a question under hash, evaluate the role of business classes in the civil disobedience movement CBSC 2017. This is a three marks question. So you will write the same answer which you have answered for question number two. Question number three. Why did the initial enthusiasm of the merchants and the industrialists fade away during the later stages of civil disobedience movement? The initial enthusiasm faded away in the later stage of movement because they were apprehensive of the spread of militant activities. They were worried about the prolonged disruption of business as well as the growing influence of socialism among the young members of Congress. Next question, question number four. Discuss the participation of industrial working class in the civil disobedience movement. Explain why the Congress was not interested in including these demands. The industrial working class did not participate in the civil disobedience movement in large numbers except in Nagpur region. Those who participated did so selectively adopting some of the ideas of Gandhian program like boycott of foreign goods as part of their own movement against low wages and poor working conditions. In 1930, thousands of workers in Chotana put tin mines wore Gandhi caps and participated in protest rallies and boycott campaigns. Congress was not interested in including their demands because it felt it would alienate industrialists and divide the anti-imperialist forces. Question number 5. Write about the role played by women in civil disobedience movement. There was large scale participation of women in civil disobedience movement. During salt marches, thousands of women came out of their homes to listen to Gandhiji. They participated in protest marches, manufactured salt, picketed foreign cloth and liquor shops. Many went to jail. In urban areas, these women were from high caste families. In rural areas, they came from rich peasant households. Moved by Gandhiji's call, they began to see service to the nation as a sacred duty of women. Question number 6. Mention efforts made by Gandhiji to get Harijans their rights. Gandhiji was of the opinion that Swaraj would not come for a hundred years if untouchability was not eliminated. He organized Satyagraha to secure them entry into temples and access to public wells, tanks, roads and schools. 
He himself taught their colonies and even lived there. He himself cleaned toilets to dignify the work of a bhangi and persuaded upper castes to change their heart and give up the sin of untouchability. He signed Puna Pact with Dr. Ambedkar through which some seats were reserved for them in provincial and central legislative councils. Next, there is a hash question that means a board question. Explain the measures taken by Gandhiji to eliminate the problems of untouchability. That means you will write the answers that I discussed just now for question number 6. Question number 7. Who organized the Dalits into the Depressed Classes Association? Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Question number 8. Explain the role of Ambedkar in uplifting the depressed classes. In 1930, Ambedkar entered national politics. In the same year, he organized the Depressed Classes Association to make them politically stronger. He was of the opinion that only political empowerment would resolve the problems of social justice. Due to his efforts, they began organizing themselves, demanding reserved seats in educational institutions and separate electorate that would choose Dalit the member for legislative councils. He was nominated as a delegate of the oppressed classes for the second roundtable conference. In that conference, he clashed with Mahatma Gandhi by demanding separate electorates for Dalits. Question number 9. Discuss the provisions and background of Pune Pact. Dr. Ambedkar clashed with Mahatma Gandhi at the second round table conference by demanding separate electorates for Dalits. When the British government conceded Ambedkar's demand, Gandhiji began a fast unto death. Gandhiji believed that separate electorates for Dalits would slow down the process of their integration into society. Ambedkar ultimately accepted Gandhiji's position and the result was the Pune Pact of September 1932. Okay. Question number 10. Write about the significance of the Pune Pact. It gave the depressed classes reserved seats in provincial and central legislative councils, but they were to be voted in by the general electorate. How did people belonging to the different communities, regions or language groups develop a sense of collective belonging? We will discuss this in the next class. Thank you.